Kia ora, good evening. The decision to exclude farm buildings from needing strengthening under the proposed building amendment bill is being welcomed by the South and District Council. The more risk-based assessment approach for rural and provincial communities is seen as a pragmatic solution that could be applied to other building types. From a practical point of view of trying to determine where all these farm buildings would be a major issue for us in itself. Um, we're, at the moment we're um, compiling a database of commercial buildings around the district as best we can. Um, we estimate we've got about 1,500 commercial buildings in the district that um, potentially could require assessed. That's excluding farm buildings, so it's good to have farm buildings out of the equation. As far as um, local community halls and churches, are they going to be also looked at, do you think? Well, yes, probably. We don't know um, what the criteria is going to be for um, what buildings are going to need to be assessed. The Society for Earthquake Engineers is suggesting that um, buildings built after 1976 not be assessed and single level timber framed um, light roof low level floor buildings um, also not require assessment. So doing some rough sums on the uh, database that we've got established already, we could be looking at around 600 buildings around the district that would still need assessed. And we estimate that that cost could be in the region of $1.2 million over the five year period where we've got to assess them. It's, it's anything from your rest home to your pharmacy to your school to your little commercial storage building on a commercial site. Low capital value, um, low rentals, it's going to be difficult to justify strengthening a building spending $100,000, $200,000. Um, you know, I just don't know, it's, it's a difficult one. What, what are the owners going to do? Uh, we could see buildings just being um, walked away from because they can't afford to do it. And then that becomes the council's problem? Certainly, certainly would. Um, we don't want that to happen, uh, so hopefully the legislators can uh, work this out in a, a risk-based approach. The exemption of the farm's buildings are a good step in the right direction? Certainly is and we really welcome that. Cost cutting at the Southern District Health Board is troubling nursing staff who fear it has the potential to compromise patient care. The New Zealand Nurses Organisation members at Southern DHB are sceptical about CEO Carol Heatley's statement about cutting costs at the DHB without affecting patient services. NZNO says nurses are already overworked and understaffed and safe staffing levels and patient care must be the top priority. They also say ward and unit managers must be allowed to approve spending when needed. Financial head Peter Behan is working on cost reduction and financial targets while plans continue for an upgrade of Dunedin Hospital. The new forecast deficit of around $14 million is almost $5 million more than predicted. Smaller class sizes would make a huge difference to the quality of teaching according to the New Zealand Educational Institute. Labor have announced plans to invest in education directly into teaching and learning. The NZEI says research shows students in smaller classes are more likely to be attentive and participate in learning, are more likely to have better reading skills, complete their education and have a lower likelihood of unemployment. According to NZEI, the move to bring 2,000 more teachers into the system is better use of $350 million than government's plan for big bonus payments for 6% of teachers and principals. It was a case of man versus woman and who wears the pants in Don Street today as the combined Rotary Clubs of Invercargill and Spirit of a Nation launched a new community event. The battle of the sexes is the urban version of competitions that have been running in rural communities in the south by Venture Southland's Jerry Ford. Featuring a range of physical, mental and comedy challenges, the stage-based activities are all about healthy competition and raising money for local children. Well, it's man versus woman instead of towns versus each other, so we're going to decide which is the superior sex, who wears the pants. You can see them arguing about that right in the background right now. So, test of comedy to see who the funnier is. Um, there's going to be modelling to see who the classiest and sexiest is. Then there's going to be impromptu comedy with improv and all sorts of competitions. So about seven competitions on stage, and at the end of it, the losing captain will have to hand over their pants. When is this happening? This is on the 23rd of August, upstairs at the Workingmen's Club. Ten best men against the ten best women, and the crowd can get involved too because there's crowd competitions, plus they know the louder they scream, the more points they win, plus you come dressed as your favourite superman or favourite superwoman hero. What are you doing with the fundraising money? 
Well, we're going to try and raise $100,000 and it's all going to kids' charities. And Rotary, who are working with me on this, combined Rotaries, five of them, they're going to put it towards things like giving kids a start and dictionaries in schools, all those type of things. How much have you raised so far in the, in the rural areas? Well, in the last year we raised 560000 and so we're over, you know, six, six and a half thousand. They just get better every time. We, we believe we can get 100000 out of this if everyone comes along and supports. Still to come after the break, award-winning craft beer, a DIY museum proposal and art in Glengarry. Welcome back. Members of the South East Marine Protection Planning Forum are about to undertake a major community and business consultation process before introducing management measures to protect key marine sites, habitats and species from Timaru to Waipapa Point. The coastline includes Otago, the only region without marine protection, home to yellow-eyed penguins, the northern royal albatross and the New Zealand sea lion. The planning forum will spend the next few months getting to grips with marine history of the southern east coast and local people are urged to attend meetings and use the forum's web and social media presence to share what's valued about the coastline. Recommendations will be put to government on what type of marine protection is appropriate and where. The skill of creating art from broken crockery and tiles is alive and well with another mosaic masterpiece being unveiled in Invercargill's Glengarry today. Today a third mosaic masterpiece took position at the Glengarry Shopping Centre. Members of the community have spent hundreds of hours creating several mosaics using mainly donated materials. The first was a set of nine flowers drawn by community members and then mosaic en masse, followed by another larger floral piece and one featuring birds. The aim of the artistic project is to get people involved in art, recycling and working together to better the Glengarry community. And from community art to an urban arts hub, the idea that anyone can create a public museum is being explored as plans to upgrade Invercargill's inner city continue. Developing a permanent multidisciplinary artistic space for creating and exhibiting art and sculpture in the CBD could generate social activity and also help eliminate fragmented art groups. Yes, yeah, so I guess I come from the debate from the um, perspective of the CBD redevelopment and um, when I was initially involved with some of the planning for that, the core concept that I was interested in was generating social activity in the CBD. So um, there was quite a lot of discussion about um, the potential for public art or public sculpture around the CBD. And um, my perspective was that really in terms of putting funding into the arts in the city, that it needed to be around um, a facility that would generate social activity. Um, so I'm interested in a sort of a, what I would term a kind of an arts hub that could be a um, centre point of creative activity in the city. Uh, so rather than um, being a sort of a, a discipline specific or being about uh, you know, a, either a gallery or a museum, this would be much more about accommodating um, creative people that are already living in and working in Invercargo. It could, for instance, support something like a um, creative business incubator. It could um, provide for filmmakers, it could provide for performing artists, it could provide for um, musicians, it could be a multidisciplinary space. Um, and this also helps facilitate that social activity that I'm talking about, allows much more for um, creative activity to occur and perhaps could also provide a home for some of those organisations that are currently looking for a place to be and also hopefully facilitate the kind of relationships that might uh, allow people to work together much more and avoid this sort of um, duplication of services or people doing the same thing in different pockets of, the, um, of Southland. I don't think you would be taking a huge risk because it's already happening here. It just doesn't really have a home or a place to be that enables um, all of that activity to generate more activity effectively um, and also to make use of resources um, in that kind of collaborative uh, environment. 
A local brewery is having international success after recently winning medals for all three craft beers submitted to the Commonwealth Craft Beer Cup held in Lexington, Kentucky in May. The Invercargill Brewery's wins comes on the back of a bronze medal at the D Dublin Craft Beer Cup in February and the encouraging kudos has the brewery increasing its commercial beer production to get more homegrown beers into beer loving bellies around New Zealand. Uh, all up the entries, um, there was 1,000 entries and 87 got medals and we got three of those. I have had expectation in the past but then if you don't get a medal you get, you get a disappointment. It's, it's really hard to pinpoint the, the, the one reason. There's a whole raft of reasons because I always see too that I'm not the only one here. It's, the, it's these guys as well. You know, they're, they're part of the success. They do a... Um, Damon's our production brewer, so he does very, very, very precise. He loves doing things absolutely spot on. So when you've got that skill level or that enthusiasm, it's, um, it translates into, into a great beer. I did have the pleasure of working with some amazing people on this project. Uh, you to, um, I've, I've had an insight on how, how skilled people are in town, um, how passionate they are. Um, there's, there's a lot of heart and soul go, gone in from everybody that's been part of this, so uh, it's been quite an experience. Where this beer has got to be one of the Yeastie Boys beer, is, um, it's a smoked beer. Very, very simple, very, very simple beer um, in, in structure, but because it uses 100% peat smoked malt, you get this intense peaty smoke flavour in the beer. What they normally do is they make a beer using it, and then what they do is put it through a still, and they distill the spirit out of it, so you get a hint of the smokiness and the peatiness, etc. But this is full on, um, full on, full on medicinal um, mud, <laughs> all those kind of things. It's one of those beers that's that nine, nine out of ten people dislike. Uh, the ne next goal is to, for, for the business, is to pretty much make beer and sell it. So we've moved into this building. And um, it's been a huge, huge move from where we came from. So the, the, the driving force is to get our beer to the, to the rest of New Zealand. And that DIY museum story and the brewery story were both courtesy of SIT students in Invercargill. And that's all from the news desk this Monday. Sport follows the weather next. From the news team, good night.